This is Justin with a quick note before today's episode. Beyond the Uniform is committed to helping military veterans succeed in their civilian career. In order to further our mission, we're launching a 2018 pledge drive. But rather than asking for donations, we're asking for reviews. If you have benefited from this show, please pay it forward by leaving us a positive review on Apple Podcast. There's a link in every episode's show notes or just Google Apple Podcasts Beyond the Uniform, and it's the number one link. Our goal between now and December 31st is to get to 150 reviews. As a way of saying thank you, we're going to pick our favorite review and send you a free copy of every Beyond the Uniform publication. That's Veterans and Consulting and Veterans at Goldman Sachs, two soft cover books, as well as printouts of our five ebooks. More importantly, your review will help us get this show in front of more members of the armed forces and military veterans. Thanks and enjoy today's episode. Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and my goal is to help military veterans succeed in their civilian career. Today's episode number 210 with Drew Kambik. I mean, it was it was tough. When you're working 20 hour days, I mean, and it, it's really seven days a week. It's I mean, it, it takes a toll. Uh, you don't get to do a lot of the things that you want to do with, you know, friends and family. And, you know, it, it is a sacrifice because it is a it's a phenomenal role. You learn a ton. You're very visible. But at the same time, you're making a lot of sacrifices for it. So doing it for a short time period uh, was acceptable to me. Running those type of 20 hour days indefinitely uh, certainly would not be. Well, my guest today, Drew, went from active duty Army sergeant to Stanford Law School, which is an incredible leap. He talks about advice for getting into law school, what it's like, why veterans may love or hate it, what career options law school opens up, and more. He also talks about his decision to go into the corporate world instead of practicing law. We talk about his work at Hewlett Packard Enterprises and how he served as chief of staff for the chief sales and and marketing officer. Uh, It's an incredibly high level position. And he talks about a crucible 10 month experience of working 20 hour days, traveling all over the world and serving an exceptionally high senior level leadership and what that's like. We also talk about how veterans are qualified to do both project management and strategic operations work. As always at beyondtheuniform.io, you'll find show notes, you'll find over 200 other episodes just like this, you'll find our coaching program and more. So with that, let's dive in to my conversation with Drew. Joining me today in San Francisco, California is Drew Kambik. Drew, thanks for making the time on Labor Day to uh, to chat with me. Thanks for having me. Uh, I wanted to give listeners a quick uh, recap of your background. Drew is the Director for Strategy and Planning, as well as the Head of Operations for License Verification in the Americas for Micro Focus, which uh, formerly was known as Hewlett Packard or Hewlett Packard Enterprises. He started out in the Army where he served for over eight years, most recently as a sergeant and infantry team leader. While on active duty, he earned a Bachelor's of Science and Bachelor's of Arts at the Ohio State University. And after his military service, he learned uh, he earned his Juris Doctorate from Stanford Law School. He has worked at HPE, or uh, now MicroFocus, as a Senior Manager for Operations Performance, as well as the Chief of Staff for the Chief Sales and Marketing Officer. So um, maybe to, to start things off, Drew, what, what led you from active duty to law school? Uh, well, the, the simple answer is my now wife. Um, uh, so uh, my, uh, my initial plan when I was 17 years old was to uh, be an enlisted man, uh, get my undergrad, uh, become an officer, go special forces. Um, Unfortunately, I, uh, for, for that plan, I fell in love with my high school sweetheart who stuck around with me through all of my enlisted service and through a couple of deployments. Um, and I had a conversation with her right before my second deployment to Afghanistan, uh, told her my plan in which I, I made her break down and cry in the middle of a restaurant. So I decided at that point, uh, maybe I should uh, decide to go a different route. And going to law school was something that uh, I had always wanted to do. Uh, we, we could probably get into that story in a little bit. 
Um, but, uh, it was really, uh, it was really a personal decision that, you know, I had done a lot of the things in the military I wanted to do. Um, and I was ready for a different challenge. How did you, um, go directly from active duty to Stanford law school? It's just such an incredible accomplishment. And I, you know, I, I talk with so many people who were officers and, and they don't get into Stanford law school. And, and just, just to go from sergeant to Stanford law school seems like such an incredible accomplishment. How did you go about that? Yeah. So it, it was a very interesting, uh, very interesting experience. I made the decision to go to law school, like I said, just before I left for Afghanistan. Um, so what I did was I brought three, you know, law school prep or the LSAT prep books, with me to Afghanistan. So I had the, the Princeton one, the Kaplan one, and then one other random book. Uh, and that was how I prepared. So in between, in between missions, in between guard shifts, uh, I would be studying. Um, and then I got off active duty, I think September 24th. And I sat for the October 5th LSAT. <laughs> oh, geez. And, uh, apparently the, uh, uh, the, the books helped me quite a bit because I scored well enough to put myself in a position to be competitive to a lot of the top tier uh, law, law schools. Um, and for me, it was a no brainer. Uh, Stanford was always my number one choice. So as soon as that one came in, I immediately picked up the phone, said yes. And I was on the first flight to uh, Palo Alto to visit the school. <laughs> uh, you you make it sound easier than it, it than I'm sure it was, but I love that thought of you lugging those three books over to Afghanistan, and I'm imagining just kind of using a lot of your free time to to really put in the hard work to get ready for that test and to to get your applications ready. If if um if someone listening to this is on active duty and they're thinking of law school. Any advice you'd have for them about the application process? Uh, well, about the application process, I would tell you to give yourself time um, because the, the LSAT is a, is, a, is a very interesting test and it's a skill set that can be acquired. And like any skill set, you're not going to pick it up overnight. The more time you give yourself, uh, the easier it's going to be on you. Um, so the, the biggest piece of advice is be disciplined about providing yourself opportunities to prepare, um, and then have a basic understanding of where are you competitive based on your, your undergraduate work and what your LSAT scores are, um, and put yourself in the best position to get in each, uh, to each of them. Talk to as many people as you can from each, talk to administrators, professors, uh, many people are going to be willing to chat with you, um, and understand what's the right school for you because um, contrary to popular belief, not all law schools are created equal. Um, if you got into both, for example, Harvard and Stanford, one may be a better fit for you, though they're both have both been ranked number one, the number one law schools in the country. So understand that subjective fit for you is also an important part of the process. What about for people who are listening who may be on the fence about whether or not to apply to law school, do you have any advice on um, indications that someone may like law school and, and indications that someone would probably hate it and it wouldn't be the right fit? Yeah, so I, I think that the, the most important thing when you're talking about going to law school is understand why you want to go. Because some people want to, to be in the courtroom you know, arguing cases, that type of thing. Like, you want law school for that. Uh, some people want to, you know, just put more letters behind their name. Like, the, there, there's easier ways to go about um, padding a resume without going to law school. Um, and then it's also, do you actually want to practice law on the backside of it? I'm sure we'll get into this. I, I am not a practicing lawyer because after my second year, I decided it wasn't for me. Um, and I was willing to kind of take a gamble on, uh, going a different route than a lot of my peers were. Um, but it, it's really understand the why behind going. And again, part of this is the subjective is the school right for me. Will it set me up in the right, uh, the right markets? Cause I mean, if you want to be a Silicon Valley lawyer coming out to Stanford, may be a great place to practice law. 
um, if you, you know, wanted to go back to your hometown and, uh, you know, be a small town lawyer, maybe getting into Stanford isn't, isn't the right decision for you. Um, but really it, it's about understanding what are you trying to set yourself up for? Because law school in itself is a phenomenal learning experience. It will teach you how to argue. It will teach you how to deconstruct and construct arguments, which is an invaluable skill, whether you practice law or not. Um, but then there's the question of, do you actually want to do the practice of law? Um, so that's, that's kind of a, yeah, that's a one of things, thing. One yeah, thing. That's one of the things I want to ask about too, is, is how you made that decision. Because it, it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, it seems like when you're in law school, you do have two pretty big paths to choose between. One would be in actually practicing law, and the, the second would be going into the more of the corporate world, which is what, what you did. And, and I'd love to hear about if, if there's an option I'm missing there, but also kind of how you decided to go corporate versus traditional law. Yeah, so the... I will say the optionality is there, but it is not communicated. When you're in law school, everyone is, they're, they're funneling you to a law firm. Um, and, and I think part of it is uh, a law school is incentivized to say we had X many people go to the top law firms in the country. Mm. Um, so that, that's a big piece of what they're trying to do while you're in law school. Um, but one of the, some of the top uh, things that you can do with an MBA is, you know, you go consulting, you go private equity, those types of things. Um, those options are available to lawyers because the, the primary thing that, you know, those, the top consulting firms, the top private equity, the top uh, banking firms are trying to do is they're trying to surround themselves with smart people, uh, not necessarily someone with a, just a narrow skill set. So you actually can, and I actually did do this. I interviewed with McKinsey and BCG. Um, I interviewed with uh, um, Morgan's family, and I, I, got, I had those opportunities. Um, so these are things that are open to you, but they won't be communicated to you. There's something you're going to have to be aware of before you go. Um, and then you're kind of going to be responsible for setting yourself up for those, you know, doing the prep the prep. Uh, cases for consulting, you know, understanding the basics of, you know, financial modeling, if you're going to go banking. Um, but those, those things are there for you. But again, they're not going to be presented to you. And what was it that brought you to Hewlett Packard Enterprises? So a, a very good friend of mine was uh, the, communica the uh, lead communication specialist for Meg Whitman at HPE. And uh, she was around uh, the COO at the time, whose name was Chris Hsu. Um, and Chris was looking for a chief of staff. Uh, and so she uh, kind of talked to me about the role, uh, asked if I would be interested, and uh, I was. So she dropped my name in. I went in, I met with Chris. Um, and then he ended up, you know, dropping me into the process to interview for this position. Um, there were three of us who were finalists, uh, for the chief of staff role. And now I've never confirmed this with Chris, uh, but the rumor was that he actually got rid of uh, several people to hire all three of us. Um, and so we formed, uh, his strategy and operations team, uh, both at HP while he was the COO. And then later when we spun off HP so uh, software into Microfocus. Focus, and he became the CEO. We followed him there. What when you were the in that chief of staff capacity? Could you take us through? I, I mean, I, I think that that's such an incredible position, and to essentially shadow someone at that level of leadership in that qual, you know that caliber of company and size of organization is really incredible, but I'd love if you could break it down into what a typical day looked like and the sorts of things that you did in that capacity. I would love to be able to articulate a typical day. Un unfortunately, there was no standard day. Um, 
really our primary mission was to fight whatever fire was burning brightest that day. And that could take us anywhere in the organization. You know, for example, if a, a particular product had a bad quarter, you know, we make it tasked with, hey, go figure out why and let's turn it around. Um, it could be, we could be working on a, spe- a specific deal. If the deal was big enough, you know, we'd work on, you know, the pricing mechanisms and those types of things. Uh, to make sure it was a win-win situation for us and our customers. Um, so there was a lot of different, uh, different tasks and skill sets that we got to use and acquire throughout the time. But uh, the basic things we got to do as in the chief of staff role is, you know, one is kind of, you do, you do a lot of the, there's kind of three big buckets. You know, bucket one is you're a glorified executive uh, assistant. Bucket two is you're a project manager. And bucket three is you are really getting deep into the strategy and operations of the organization. So the, the glorified uh, executive administrator piece, I mean, it's, you know, you have to do a lot of the, set up a lot of the meetings with, you know, uh, customer executives, you know, do the uh, preparation documents and stuff like that. If this is for a deal or, um, if you want to like, get into the historical dealings with a, a customer, you'd set all that kind of stuff up. Uh, the project manager piece is, I mean, there's various things going on at any given time, whether it's, you know, next year's planning, whether it's setting up training events for uh, the internal team, uh, financial pieces, any of these, you have a hand in um, making sure that they're delivering on time, on target. Uh, and then the final piece is the strategy and operation stuff. And this is, it can be the, amorph- the amorphous questions like, you know, what should we do moving forward if X happens? It could be, you know, how do we resurrect a product that's struggling? It's how do we get the right people uh, into the right roles to turn something around? Uh, so I would say the last bucket, the strategy part is probably the most fun bucket. And the first bucket is probably... Uh, the least fun, but uh, it serves an important role as well. So I imagine the executive assistant type work is is something that any veteran could do, but I'm wondering for those other two buckets, <laughs> like did law school prepare you for that or where did you learn about the project management aspects and the strategic stuff that you were doing? Uh, the, the project management stuff, I will actually say that the... Uh, the military actually trains you very well for that because it's, it's simply a matter of discipline. Um, at, at any point, if you've ever led at any level uh, in the military, you understand how to back plan. You understand that at particular time X, you need to deliver something. And so you just figure out how much time does it take to hit each milestone and figure out who's responsible for each thing. Um, and it's really understanding roles and responsibilities and how to basically effectively timeline. And then that, if you can do that well, then you have the fundamentals to do to be a project manager. Um, if you can deliver what needs to be delivered on time, I mean that's that is the the crux of being a project manager. Now to do to do it very well, I mean there's other things you want to bring to the table, but that skill set alone will make you successful uh, as a project manager. The, the strategy piece, um, I, I don't think any one thing, whether it was the military or law school, prepared me for that. Um, I, I think it's more of a, one, it's an intellectual curiosity. I like to understand how things work, um, and I like to look for hidden efficiencies in a system. Um, there's, you will see some of that in the military. Uh, there's certainly you know, deep strategic thinking in law school. Um, but really it's the essence of problem solving. Can you identify what is the main issue? Can you identify what it is we're trying to solve for? And can you put the right things in place to solve the problem? And and that's, that's, I mean, it's what a, the consultant cases are preparing you for. Can you identify the problem? Can you ask the right questions? to reveal the issue, and then can you figure out what's the best way to solve it? If you can do those things, uh, you can be successful at strategy work. And there's no class you can take or 
law school or MBA work that's really going to prepare you for that completely. Um, a lot of it is you understanding that process um, for solving problems. What was the lifestyle like when you were serving in that capacity? Like, was there a, a typical number of hours <laughs> per week you were working? Were you traveling a lot? What was that like? So absolutely traveling a lot. Um, you know, I, I think in the month of February of this year, I think I spent four or five days uh, at home. We, I mean, we, I mean, we traveled to, to Bangkok for a little while, to Provo, Utah for a little while, to Madrid for a little while, just doing various uh, training events uh, around, the, around the world. Um, and so naturally you have longer days. So for example, you know, you fly to Bangkok, you do your, the tip of the typical day there, uh, you know, in Asia Pacific, but then you actually stay up to do your day job when America's up. So on those days, you know, you're running 24 hour days, um, which can get rough when you start stacking them up on top of each other. I mean, for a military audience, you know what that's like. Um, now, I will say that the, the typical day for me in the role was probably 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. I was in the office working. And then I was probably on working on other things or on call for other things up until about midnight. Midnight to 4 a.m. Uh, was pretty quiet. And then uh, the person I was working for, 4 a.m. every day, uh, she was up firing off emails. So <laughs> it, it made for an interesting, an interesting time period. Uh, Cause uh, she, I mean, she worked harder and longer than anybody. And as the chief of staff, you are essentially obligated to do the same. Oh man. Um, what was that like? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of you being married. What was that period like? I mean, that just sounds like an intense period of travel and, and work. <laughs> My wife was very happy that I no longer have that role. <laughs> um, it was, I mean, it was, it was tough. When you're working 20 hour days, I mean, and it, it's really seven days a week. It's, I mean, it, it takes a toll. Uh, you don't get to do a lot of the things that you want to do with, you know, friends and family. Um, and, you know, it, it is a sacrifice because it is a, it's a phenomenal role. You learn a ton. You're very visible. Um, but at the same time, you're making a lot of sacrifices for it. So doing it for a short time period, uh, was acceptable to me. Um, running those type of 20 hour days indefinitely, uh, certainly would not be. Um, but l luckily for me, you know, I, nine, the, uh, I think it was 10 months I was running that role and then I had to transition into something else. Um, so it, it, I, I ran it about as long as I would have wanted to. Uh, probably a year would have been the cap for running that at that pace is um i mean i can imagine the people that you're meeting in this capacity and then also just you know when you're working 20 hours a day you are i'm imagining you're just, you're learning a ton you're just compressing years worth of learning down into that that 10 month period do you have a sense though that uh you know if someone had their sights on being ceo of a company like uh, micro focus or Hewlett Packard is that, um, are they maintaining that pace for decades to be able to do that? Like, is that, or is that kind of always just a one or two year stint in that sort of extreme crucible experience? I would say that it's, it is a personal thing. Um, so, for example, uh, our CEO would every day at 6 a.m. He would go home and he would be unplugged until 9 p.m. And that time was for his family. Um, and I mean, that was like sacred time that you would not schedule for anything. Mm. And so he, like, he, he blocked out the times of his day where he was going to go you know, full speed and the times of his day that he was going to devote to his family. Um, the, the person I uh, was chief of staff for. Uh, she had uh, two grown kids who were at college, so she put in 20-hour days, um, and that was just her baseline. 
I mean, she had a high motor. She didn't need much sleep. Uh, so that worked for her. And that was something that she could do indefinitely. Um, but I, I don't, I don't get the sense that, you know, 20 hour days for, uh, the executives is normal. Um, now for the chief of staff, I will say you will probably work longer days than your executive because I mean, you have to be prepared for them to walk in the door and start the day. And then you're typically on their hip doing either in meetings in parallel or contributing to the meetings that they're in throughout the day. And then there's work you need to do when they go, when the executive goes home at the end of the day. Mm. So you're typically running a, a, a higher cadence than the executive is. Um, there are some executives who can run at that high pace. There's a lot of them who don't. Um, part of it's a personal decision. Part of it is if the company is delivering the number um, on eight hour work days, that's fantastic. Uh, if you're not delivering the number, you're probably going to be working much longer days. Mm. And, how would you describe, I, I introduced you and you have a very long title right now, but just to, to re, uh, redo that, Director, mm -hmm. Director for Strategy and Planning, Head of Operations for License Verification in the Americas. Uh, could you translate that for us and talk a little bit more about um, how you transitioned to that role and what sort of work you do there now? Mm -hmm. So the, there, there's really two pieces to that. One is the Director of Strategy and Planning. Um, you can, you can kind of think of that as a rank. Um, I, I'm in the, I'm in a strategy vertical, um, and I'm a director level. So I report to a VP of strategy who, who reports to the CEO. Um, and it's, that's that piece. I, I'm at that seniority level for strategy and operations work. Um, I was asked at the end of my chief of staff stint, the reason I did 10 months instead of 12 was we were there was a part of our organization license verification um, that was struggling and we needed to get a turnaround fast to help us close the, uh, the the quarter at the time and then the year and so i was asked to go um help uh identify what some of the issues were and turn it around and so that uh, made me the head of uh operations for license verification in the Americas. Um, and really what, so license verification means when you're selling software, uh, you may buy a certain number of, you know, we'll call it terabytes. You know, we bought a hundred terabytes. Well, there's really no way to prevent a customer from using more than they bought. So a customer may have bought a hundred terabytes, but they're using 200. So what license verification does is it goes to the customer and says, the customer, you bought 100, you're using 200, so let's, um, let's do a transaction to get you in compliance. So you, you have the right number of licenses to do what you need to do. Uh, we were not doing a particularly good job at that uh, on the Heritage uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise side. So we had to go and do some uh, procedural things um, and get some of the right leaders in the right places to turn that around. Um, but the, that with uh, the license verification typically contributes somewhere between 20 and 25% of the revenue for any given quarter um, for license sales. So when that's, when that's doing well, it's a big contributor when it's failing, it causes big misses. So that was something that we needed to fix and fix quickly. Um, so that was what I've been working on for the past. Uh, four or five months. And it sounds like that was similar to one aspect of the work that you were doing before. Um, what does it look like from a lifestyle standpoint? I, it sounds like things have, have thankfully slowed down, but uh, could you just describe kind of travel and uh, hours per week or kind of when you get in the office, when you leave type of stuff? So the the baseline for me for a long time was, you know, in the office by 8 a.m., uh, home by 6, 6.30, and I'd probably answer, I'd be responsive to emails to about 9 o'clock. Um, that, that, would, that would be what was typical. Um, and I, that was before I became the chief of staff, and that was after uh, I left being the chief of staff. Uh, so that would be my, uh, how, how it pretty much functions now. Uh, it's, uh, I'm very, very happy to be done with the 20 hour days.
And I'm wondering if um, if someone listening is is interested in this sort of work or just high tech in general, um, are there any resources you would recommend to them that could be books or conferences or podcasts or just anything that's helped you in your civilian career that might help listeners? Uh, well, when it, when it comes to podcasts, the one thing I will say is, and it, this is not a, a tech specific um, thing, I would actually start with Joe Rogan. And, and the reason is, is he interviews absolutely everybody. He goes in with, he has no problem asking questions. And so you, you get to, uh, a lot is revealed in his interviews. So, I mean, he's got, he's done thousands of interviews. He has interviewed someone who will be interesting to you, whether it's in tech or anything else. Um, and just listen to him ask questions, and that will lead you to a lot of places. Uh, that will lead you to other people uh, and other podcasts. Um, when it comes to, you know, things to read, uh, a, a big th one for me is uh, I, I get my news from Axios every day. Axios.com, which is a, you know, a, a news curation site. I've gotten out of the habit of, you know, going towards uh, traditional news outlets. Um, Cause I'm more interested in content than spin. Um, so, and then when it comes to books, what I would tell you is figure out what you enjoy reading. And that'll probably in, be a good indicator of what you should be pursuing as a career. Cause if you're reading books on tech, and it's putting you to sleep. Like I, I know tech is a great market to be in, but if you don't like the content, you should probably go somewhere else. Um, and so I'm sorry, I can't give you specific read, you know, these three books, um, but figure out what it is that you enjoy reading about, uh, whether it's about AI, whether it's about, you know, the cloud or something non-tech. Uh, start reading, and if it intrigues you, that's probably something you want to pursue. Awesome. And for listeners at beyondtheuniform.io, I'll, I'll add in the show notes a link to Joe Rogan's podcast and Axios.com. I think those are both great, great recommendations. Um, well, Drew, I always like to end with an open-ended question, which is we've covered a lot of ground about law school, about your corporate career path and advice. Um, what have we not covered that you want to make sure listeners know before we wrap up? The, the one thing I'll say for, you know, people making the decision to transition out of uh, the military and maybe pursue, uh, you know, an undergraduate degree or a graduate degree in law, business, engineering, whatever it is, it's do not underestimate the value of going to a top tier institution. And, uh, I, I will tell tell my story on this. Um, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I did my undergrad at Ohio State. And when I decided to go to law school, I was just going to go to law school at Ohio State. And my brother, I have an older brother who's a graduate of Northwestern. He got his MBA. Um, he was basically telling me, you know, Drew, you have to go to the best law school you can get into. Um, and I went to prove that it didn't matter. So I figured out what is the starting salary for a graduate from Harvard Law School and what's the starting salary from someone from the Ohio State Law School. Well, not only was I wrong, I was hugely wrong, almost by a factor of like 40 percent. At the time, the starting salary from someone from Harvard Law School was 160K, coming from uh, Ohio State with 90K. And that was the difference between Harvard was number one at the time and number 30. So understand that there is a tiering system to all of the top schools, all of the top graduate schools, and it actually will impact opportunities you have down the line. So the best school that you can get into that is a good fit for you is a good investment. Just spending money on a, on, uh, I don't want to disparage education, but a less than reputable educational source may not be the best, may not lead to the best outcome for you. I, I love that because there is enough information publicly available now um, to be able to show for most schools um, that percentage that obtain a job, the average salary, things like that. 
But I also appreciate uh, the way, Drew, you, you kind of highlight those two aspects that I think are equally important, which is, you know, not just the credibility of the school, but then also what is a right fit for you. And that's why I think that those mm -hmm. admit weekends or school visitations are great to be able to go and visit and get a sense for, is this a place I want to spend time? Are these people that are going to really enrich my life? Um, are, you know, typical things that people do from here, things that I aspire to? And that could be geographic, that could be functional focus or, or reputation for some sort of niche focus of a school. But um, I think that both of those are equally important. But I, I tend to agree with you, Drew, that it does that the reputation of a school does matter, and especially when you combine that with all the data available about uh, those mm -hmm. important components, it's it's worth paying attention to those. I mean, and, and to your point, uh, and especially for those pursuing, like thinking about pursuing an MBA, what you're really buying is two things. Number one is the brand of the school, and two is the classmate. Yep. Um, because the that peer network is what is the most valuable commodity from any particular institution. Um, so at any given point, you can call up uh, friends uh, that you had uh, at grad school, and they're all going to be doing fantastic things, and that can create opportunities for you. Awesome. Well, Drew, I appreciate your time today on a holiday and uh, sharing your story with the Beyond the Uniform audience. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a great rest of the day and really appreciate it. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond the Uniform. There are over 200 free episodes at beyondtheuniform.io. They're classified by the industry of focus, the functional role the person plays, and more. Beyond the Uniform is hosted, produced, and edited by me, Justin Asiri. Our director of outreach, responsible for sponsorship and guest episodes, is Steve Bain. Our editor, responsible for the show notes and text transcripts for all episodes, is Kathleen Dillon. Our data analytics and insights advisor is Andrew Woolridge. If you are enjoying Beyond the Uniform, you can help us out by telling your veterans and friends in the military about this free resource. There is more information on the website about how you can sponsor an episode or donate to our program to help us grow the work that we're doing. Be sure to check out the coaching section of beyondtheuniform.io where you can be paired with professional, subsidized coaches to help you figure out your next career move. You can sign up for our newsletter to be up to date on the latest happenings at Beyond the Uniform. And in each show notes section, there is a link to audible.com which is providing a free audiobook of your choice to Beyond the Uniform listeners. You get a free book of your choosing, and Beyond the Uniform gets $15 to subsidize the cost of the show, regardless of whether you can continue with audible.com or not. Check that out and more in the show notes for this episode. Keep the feedback coming. Let me know what resources would help you in your career, and we'll do our best to make that happen. Take care, be safe, and I'll be back next week with more interviews with military veterans about their civilian career.